trigger warning. If you're not used to having your long-held religious, spiritual, and cultural beliefs challenged by what the Word of God actually says, brace yourself. Hey, shalom, my homies. Today we're going over Exodus chapter 27 through chapter 30, Tetzeva, which means to order. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. Dimension as vast as space and time, as vast as the spirit of the living God. In the middle ground between this is light and shadow, truth and a lie, Mount Ebal and Mount Yagazim. Between this is science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his hopes in God. This is the dimension of imagination. It's an area in which we call the Torah zone. Hey, welcome back. We're on to another episode of the Torah Zone. This is episode, this is actually Parasha 20, which is Tez, te, te, I can't say it right now, Tetzav. <laughs> it means you are to order. What is he supposed to order? A cheeseburger? <laughs> no. He's supposed to order the people to follow God's commands. Now, <clears throat> This one has some fascinating, interesting historical references in it. Uh, we start with uh, uh, chapter 27, verse 20 of the book of Exodus, Shemot in Hebrew. Uh, you are to order the people of Israel to bring you pure oil. That's olive oil. First press olive oil. Pounded olives for the light, and you are to keep the lamp burning continually. That's ner Tamid in Hebrew, a perpetual light. It's supposed to continue 24-7. And, uh, of course, we see this referenced in the, uh, the traditions and the understanding of Hanukkah, where the light was put out, and they had to light, relight the lamps, rededicate the temple after uh, the, the invasion of uh, the Greeks, if I remember correctly. And, <clears throat> and the oil lasted longer than it should have. And it's one of the, quote, miracles of that. Although, historically, there's some, still some question of what happen in that respect. But the point being is that in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, the menorah, the lampstand, is supposed to be perpetually lit with the purest of olive oil. Interesting thing about olives. <laughs> it is the oldest cultivated plant by human beings on the planet. Nothing has been cultivated longer than olives. Uh, and the olive tree can be hundreds and sometimes a thousand years old. That's really crazy to think about. In fact, in Israel, I think it was 20 or 30 years ago, they found these big olive tree stumps that had been cast aside by the roadside in a <clears throat> construction area. And they decided to plant them and water them and see if they would grow. Nobody really knew how old they were, hundreds of years old. They thought they were dead and dried up pieces of wood. But as they began to water them and nurture them, guess what happened? New olive trees began to grow out of the root ball. That is so amazing. The olive tree is astounding. And then, of course, us as Gentiles, we are grafted in. We are the new vine or the new uh, uh, grafting into the root of Israel. And from there, we grow and we're grafted out. Uh, and we become part of the uh, joint inheritance. We don't replace Israel. So don't make that mistake. We're not here to replace Jews. We don't replace Israel. As the scripture teaches, Paul teaches us, we become one new man in Messiah, both Jew and Gentile together. We see that in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah and several other places where God's desire is to restore what was lost and bring us together as one new man, one staff in his hand, two sticks brought back together. That's beautiful prophecy. So the pure oil is from pounded olives uh, to light the menorah. And that oil has to be with no particles in it. It has to be absolutely crystal clear pure. Why is that important? Because the oil represents God's anointing. It represents God's light to the world. And in the purity of the oil, there's no smoke produced. The more pure it is. If the oil is cloudy or hazy, then when you light that oil, it produces smoke. And that's, uh, that's not good. It creates a, a, a smoke residue that can fill the uh, Holy of Holies and cause some, uh, some residue to land on the surfaces. <coughs> so Aaron and his sons are to put the tent of Midi, which is the Mishkan, outside the curtain in front of the testimony. The testimony is the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone, and keep it burning from evening until morning before the Lord. This is to be a permanent 
regulation through all the generations of the people of Israel. It's supposed to be permanent. Now, what's fascinating is it's not. The temple hasn't existed for hundreds, if not 2,000 years. The temple has been destroyed. And so in the destruction of that temple, this has not been going on. But this is an image of what God has uh, actually happens in heaven. This is a mirror image. The goal is the the uh, object lesson I think the Father's trying to show us is he wants to bring heaven to earth. He wants his kingdom to come and his will to be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Sound familiar? Oh yeah, that's the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? The whole process. God is trying to say, I want to bring heaven to earth. I want you to know me and to be known by me in a practical, tangible, real way. <clears throat> and then of course in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, we are to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of Yah. And I think that's a beautiful imagery that there was a Mishkan, a mobile temple, then eventually the first temple was built, then destroyed, and then the second temple was built and then destroyed, and then we'll see a third temple. Uh, and uh, that brings about the book of Revelations and a whole bunch of interesting other stuff. But Paul and the apostles make it clear that we are now the temple, the dwelling place of God's Holy Spirit. And that's a beautiful analogy. So let's take a look at this a little bit deeper. Chapter 28, you're to summon your brother Aaron or Achon and his sons to come from among the people of Israel to you so they can serve as Kohanim. Aaron and his son Nadav, uh, Nadavi, Avihu, uh, and Eleazar, and Itmar are to make for your brother Aaron garments set apart for serving God, specific clothing, um, expressing dignity and splendor. Speak to all the craftsmen to whom I have given the spirit of wisdom. Where's the spirit of wisdom to craft things come from? It comes from the Lord. <clears throat> and have them make Aaron's garments to set him apart. That means holy to set him apart that he can serve me in the office of the Kohen. The garments are to be made of these things, a breastplate, a ritual vest and a robe, checkered tunic, a turban, a sash, and they are to make holy garments set apart for a specific purpose. For your brother Aaron and his sons, that he can serve me in the office of Kohen, that means the high priest, and they are to use gold, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and fine linen. They are to make ritual vest of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, finely woven, crafted, and skilled by artisans. This is supposed to look really cool and look really beautiful, eye-catching. Attached to its front and back edges are to be shoulder pieces fastened together. So it's a full breastplate, very similar to a, um, a military breastplate. And that's a, that's a fascinating imagery. Uh, I think what conjures up in my mind is actually in Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul's talking about put on the full armor of God. And most people think he was referencing Roman armor, which would fit the story, but it also fits the priestly vestments. He's supposed to have a breastplate of righteousness. He's supposed to have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He's supposed to have the shield of faith which extinguishes all the fiery missiles of the evil one. He's supposed to have his feet shod with the preparation of gospel of peace. And then he's supposed to have uh, the belt of truth and the helmet of salvation. And so it's an interesting image. Whether Paul was referencing the priest in the temple or referencing a Roman soldier's armor, either way, it still plays out the same way. We look like the high priest. We look like Jesus, Yeshua, when we're in that armor, the enemy can't tell. Is that Jesus in there? Or is that that crazy guy who wants to follow Jesus? It doesn't matter. I got my, my, <laughs> I got beat up before confronting Jesus. I'm not doing it again. The enemy runs. Resist the enemy and he will flee from you. So then he, this is the interesting thing. He says, take two uh, onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the son of Israel. Six uh, names on the one and six remaining names on the other in the order of their birth. The engraver should engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones as he would engrave a seal. Mount the stones in gold settings and put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the vest. The stones called to mind the sons of Israel. Aaron's to carry their names before the Lord and his two shoulders as a reminder. Make gold squares, two chains of pure gold, twisted like cords, attached to a cord and a chain in the squares. Make a breastplate for judging. Have it crafted by skilled artisans and work of the ritual vest. Make it of gold, 
which means purity, uh, blue, which represents the Father, purple, which represents royalty, which I believe is Jesus. He is the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace, and scarlet, which is red. That represents Adama, represents the, the uh, I believe, humanity, but also the fact that the Messiah is fully God and fully man, and he is the Son of the Living God. Finely woven linen, uh, folded in double squares, hand span by hand span, etc., etc. So a lot of details. The type of stones are to be used. They're mounted in gold settings. The stones will correspond to the names of the twelve sons of Israel, and they're to be engraved with a seal and represent the twelve tribes. <clears throat> now we see that represented in the New Testament with First Peter chapter two, verse four and five. We are all rocks, living stones. So when we come back, we're going to go into something very interesting about what the sin offering represents and Jesus, how he was not made in, unclean by the woman with the issue of blood and the little girl that he raised from the dead. It's fascinating. You'll be thrilled. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Digital Pastor Jim will be right back with more Torah Zone. Hey, shalom, my homies. This is Digital Pastor Jim with the Torah Zone. Every Friday night, beginning on the Sabbath at 6 p.m., Saturday at 3 a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm excited to spend every Sabbath with our listeners here on His Kingdom Radio, presenting you the Torah portion readings and other Hebraic Roots insights. Come and learn about our Hebraic Roots in Yeshua, Jesus, and His disciples. I'll bring a new appreciation to the Word of God. Let us know what you think. Feel free to contact us at 719-243-0996 or go to His Kingdom Radio website, www.hkrshineon.net. Send us an email if you have any questions or prayer needs. Hope to hear back from you soon. And remember, God has a name. Do you know His name? And He's chosen you by name to be His very own. Shalom Aleichem, my friends. Hey, shalom, my homies. Hey, if you've been inspired by our teaching, if you find this interesting and fascinating and want to help support the Wild Branch Ministries as we reach out to people across the globe, I would like for you to buy me a cup of coffee, a digital cup of coffee. So it's a digital cup of Joe. Just scan this QR code right here and buy me a cup of coffee and help support the outreach of the Wild Branch Ministry. Have a blessed day. Hey, welcome back. We've got some fascinating things to discuss in this next portion of this all very powerful understanding of what the priests are about. So we have the breastplate, the different stones. We have the urum and the turum that are different stones that are, I think, some create the image, it's, it's placed behind the breastplate and they will glow and the stones will glow in reference of asking God questions. And then with the names of all the tribes engraved in the stones, it's thought by some historically that those stones would glow and they would give, they could actually spell out answers to specific questions that God, that they were proposing of the Lord. Other times it was like a, a black stone and a white stone. If the answer is no, the answer is yes, sort of a, a binary input. Uh, in and out, yes or no. <clears throat> now, we don't really have a lot of details other than that, historically. Uh, thankfully, we have the Holy Spirit now who speaks to us through his written word and through an inner witness and through confirmation through other brothers and sisters. I can't tell you how many times where I felt the Lord beginning to speak to me about something and then someone comes up to me and says, you know, I've been praying for you and this is something God showed me. And it confirmed what I felt the Lord was already leading me to do. In a way, it's kind of like the Urim and the Turim. Uh, one God is inspiring me to do one thing and then he confirms his word out of the mouth or two or three witnesses, either within scripture itself or brothers and sisters who I trust, know, and love in my life. If you don't have that in your life, find a good congregation, get involved, and let the Lord begin to heal you and minister to you in that way. So that's a, that's a freebie. <laughs> so <clears throat> we are on to chapter 28. Um, you're to make a robe, a ritual vest entirely of blue, and blue is a color that's thought of to represent the Father, and to have it opening for the head in the middle, so it's almost like a, a, a something he would put over his head, uh, a border woven blue, purple, and scarlet. Again, those colors are repeated over and over and over. In my mind, it represents that the high priest is a visual representation, a placeholder, if you will, of 
Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, as fully man and fully God, standing as our mediator uh, before the Lord so that we can then approach the Father. Um, <clears throat> So they're supposed to make a turban over Aaron's forehead because Aaron bears the guilt for any errors committed by the people of Israel in consecrating their holy gifts. The ornament on the turban is always to be on his forehead so that the gifts for the Lord will be accepted by him. You are to weave checkered tunic of fine linen, make a turban of fine linen, make a belt, a weaver of colors. Likewise, Aaron's sons to make tunics, sashes, and headgear expressing dignity and splendor. Interesting, there's an emphasis on what it's supposed to conjure up the image in, in a person's mind. Dignity and splendor. With, the, with them clothe your brother Aaron and his sons. Then anoint them, inaugurate them, and consecrate them. The idea is um, like when someone is anointed uh, in the New Testament with oil and prayed over, and in the Old Testament, that's when someone is shmichat. It means the laying on of hands. When a rabbi is ordained as a rabbi in a synagogue, messianic or otherwise, they have a shmicha, a time of laying on of hands. So that's kind of the idea here. And he's supposed to be anointed with oil. And in other passages, we see the oil is poured out like the whole carafe of oil. So next time we have a prayer meeting uh, in our prayer group, I'm going to invite uh, Craig and his wife Elena over, and we're going to anoint them with oil and just dump the whole thing on his head just for fun. But uh, <laughs> all right. All right. Probably wouldn't do that. But. But it's a fun thought anyway. Craig would like it, I'm sure, because I know he's, he would find that entertaining and exciting. So, uh, make for them linen shorts, reaching from the waist to the thigh to cover their bare flesh. Good to be modest, even before the Lord. Aaron and his sons are to wear them where they go in the tent of meeting when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place so they won't incur guilt and die. That part I don't like. I don't want guilt and die. So yeah, cover up your uh, personal parts. This is to be a perpetual regulation both for him and his descendants. Now we're moving on to chapter 29. Here is what you're due to consecrate them for ministry to me in the office of the Kohen. Take a young bull, two rams without defect. So they got to be inspected. They can't have any kind of minor flaws in them whatsoever. They inspect them top and bottom, inside and out, every possible way to make sure they are physically perfect. Uh, also, matzah, which is that flatbread, matzah cakes mixed with olive oil, and matzah wafers spread with oil, all made from fine wheat flour. Put them together in a basket and present them in a basket along with the bull and the two rams. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent meeting. Wash them with water because he wants us to approach him. It's a tevilah, it's a baptism, if you will of water for cleansing. Take the garments and put on Aaron the tunic, the robe of the ritual vest, and all of itself the breastplate. Fasten him with the belt, put the turban on his head, and attach the holy ornaments to the tournament. Because it was, uh, it was uh, fringed with uh, pomegranates and, and little bells, so you can hear the, the priest tinkling around and, as he walked through the, the process of, of ministering before the Lord. Then to take the anointing oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head. <coughs> Bring his sons and put tunics on them, wrap sashes around them, and put the headgear on their heads. The office of the Kohen is to be theirs by a permanent regulation. Thus you will consecrate Aaron and his sons. And now we get down to the part of the sin offering. So bring the young bell to the front tent of the meeting. Aaron and his sons are to lay hands on the bull's head, transferring their sins and the sins of the people to the bull. And you are to slaughter the bull in the presence of the Lord in the entrance of the tent. Take some of the bull's blood, Put it on the horns of the altar, because there was little uh, horn features that would come off the altar. With your fingers, pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Take all the that covers the inner organs, the coverings of the liver. This is, gets a little graphic. Kidneys, fat, offer that up and smoke altar to the Lord. But the bull's flesh, skin, and other parts, are, you are to destroy by fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Now... <clears throat> We see later in Leviticus, where it goes over in detail, let me turn there real quick, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 27. Something very fascinating about the sin offering. Now, every other offering, uh, grain offerings, drink offerings, uh, all the different offerings, it says that if anything, after it's been dedicated to the Lord, if anything touches that offering, then the offering becomes unclean, except for the sin offering. So Leviticus chapter 6, verse 27, yeah, this is going to blow your mind. Uh, 627, if I can find it quickly here. 
whatever, so this is talking about the sin offering. The Kohen who offers the sin is to eat it. You're supposed to eat the flesh or to eat the meats, like a barbecue kind of thing. Eaten in the holy place in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches its flesh will become holy. Every other offering, whatever it touches after it's been dedicated, then that offering becomes unholy. But in this instance, the sin offering, the covering for the sins of the people, whatever it touches becomes holy. See my point? So, uh, so whatever touches the flesh becomes holy. Any of its blood splashes on the item of clothing, you're to wash it in a holy place. The clay pot which is cooked must be broken. It's cooked in a bronze pot. It must be scoured and rinsed in water. Any male from the family of the Kohanim may eat the sin offering. It is especially holy. But no sin offering which has had any of its blood part blood brought into the tent of meeting is to make atonement in the holy place. It is to be eaten and then to be burned up completely. So there's not supposed to be anything left of the sin offering. Why do I bring this up? What happens when someone touches a dead body according to the Torah? It says they become ritually unclean. They become impure and they have to do a tevilah mikvah, which means a baptism in a mikvah to become clean again. They have to wait seven days and then do a ritual cleansing and then they become clean again. But what did Jesus do for the little girl, for Jairus's daughter? She was dead and he laid hands on her. Now, according to the Torah, that would make him unclean, ritually impure. Um, some would say that'd be a violation of the Torah. I don't know if it's necessarily a violation. It's not a sin per se. It just means it makes him unclean. But what happened to the little girl? She was raised from the dead. What happened to the woman previous to that? who was also the same age, or she had the issue of blood the same length of time the little girl was alive, 14 years if I remember correctly. Um, she had the issue of blood. While he was going to Jairus' house to heal the little girl, the woman reached out and grabbed the seat seat, the hem of his garment, the tassel. And as she did, Jesus stopped and he said, who touched me? And his disciples went, who didn't touch you? Everybody around here is touching you. He says, no, someone touched me and virtue went out of me. When she grabbed the hem of his garment, she was instantly healed of the issue, the nida in Hebrew, the issue of blood that had never stopped. I believe, now I can't verify this theologically or biblically or historically, but my sense about this, because the length of time of her issue of blood and the age of the little girl, I believe she was her mother. I believe... She knew where Messiah was because her husband called the Messiah to come and heal their daughter. So she knew if I could get there, if he's going to heal my daughter, I want to be healed too. Now that's not in the scripture. That's my conjecture. Take it for what it's worth. But wouldn't that be a beautiful addition to the story? She reached out and touched the hem of his garment. Now a woman with an issue of blood, anything she touches becomes richly impure. But Jesus said virtue went out and healed her completely. <clears throat> I believe because he, it was the sin offering, anything he touched became holy and pure. It went out of him and purified everything he touched. Isn't that a beautiful image? So we're going to move on to our next section, but I just want you to think about that in the break. He touches you and makes you pure and holy also. Be right back. Don't go anywhere. Digital Pastor Jim will be right back with more Torah Zone. Hey, this is Digital Pastor Jim. I want to let you know you can join us on YouTube at the Wild Branch Ministries on YouTube. Every Friday evening, we'll upload the current Torah Zone portion so you can celebrate with us the evening of the Sabbath and follow us on the Torah portion. Have a blessed day today, my friends. Hey, shalom, my homies. This is Digital Pastor Jim with the Torah Zone. Every Friday night, beginning on the Sabbath at 6 p.m., Saturday at 3 a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm excited to spend every Sabbath with our listeners here on His Kingdom Radio, presenting you the Torah portion readings and other Hebraic Roots insights. Come and learn about our Hebraic roots in Yeshua, Jesus, and His disciples. I'll bring a new appreciation to the Word of God. Let us know what you think. Feel free to contact us at 719-243-0996 or go to His Kingdom Radio website, www.hkrshineon.net. Send us an email if you have any questions or prayer needs. Hope to hear back from you soon. And remember, God has a name. Do you know His name? And He's chosen you by name to be His very own. Shalom Aleichem, my friends.
All right. Welcome back, my friends. <clears throat> Just want to remind you that uh, that that it's the beautiful part. Jesus did not, Yeshua, he did not violate any part of the Torah. He did not break any single law. Now, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the religious leaders accused him of breaking the law. They said, your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. They say that... Uh, <clears throat> They were, they were uh, getting some grain on the Sabbath to have a snack as they walked along. But those were additions to the Torah. That was not in the Torah. Those were the additional laws, the oral written traditions added to the Torah. Many times the rabbis would call it making a hedge around the hedge so they don't accidentally violate the Torah. But Jesus went out of his way on purpose to insult them and make sure that he was that they knew that he was Moshiach, he was the Messiah, uh, when they accused him of doing something wrong by healing the blind man on the Sabbath. No blind man had ever been healed before, not blind from birth. And he healed him on the Sabbath. And so much so, so mysterious was this event that the blind man didn't even know who it was. So when he was interrogated by the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, and they said, who was it that healed you on the Sabbath? He must be a sinner. He says, I don't know who he was. But all I can tell you was I was born blind, and now I can see. Whoever he was, he must have been the son of the living God. He must be Messiah. And they were confounded. So they brought his parents in to interrogate them. And they said, what, was your son born blind? They said, he's of age. You can ask him himself. He can, he can actually testify for himself. What happened? All we know is our son was born blind, and now he sees. Who healed him? It has to only be the Messiah. He's the only one prophetically who would heal someone blind from birth. I love that so much. So Jesus didn't break the Torah. He fulfilled it completely, even down to the minute faction that he, when someone unclean, when he touched something unclean or someone unclean touched him, virtue goes out from him and he makes it holy because he is the sin offering for all of the world. And I just love that. Bring a young bull to the front of the tent of the meeting. Aaron and sons will lay their hands on the bull's head, transferring their sins to it. And that's the sin offering. Uh, <clears throat> then they're to take another ram. Aaron and sons are to lay hands on the ram, which is shmicha. That means laying on of hands. The ram's head. And you're to slaughter the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and the lobe of his son's right ears and their right thumbs and on their big toe on their right of their foot. And the rest of the blood is to splash on the sides of the altar. What is the significance of that? Well, think about it. If the blood of the sin offering makes them whole and cleanses them, uh, the only offerings that will do that, when you put the blood on the earlobe, it means everything you hear is now made holy. You're to incline your ear. The scripture says, Shema Yisrael. That means to listen to obey Israel. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19.18 and Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. And then the right thumb, because everything in which your hand touches, you're supposed to represent the hand of the living God. What is God's holy name? Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. Yod in ancient Hebrew, is literally an inscription of the right hand. Hey means behold. Vav is a nail or a tent peg or a hook. And then behold. So even in God's holy name, behold the hand, the right hand that is now holy. Behold the nail. He was pierced through for our sins and our transgressions. He was the ultimate sacrifice. He was the sin offering that whatever it touches now becomes holy. Let Yeshua, Jesus, touch you and make you holy once again. Do you have sin in your life? I know you do. Let him touch you. Let him heal you and restore you. Do it now. And so the blood on the, on the right hand, on his thumb, and on the right foot. Because what does it say in Joshua? Every place on which your foot shall tread, the Father says, I have given it to you. What does that mean? And then later in Scripture, in the New Testament, it says, even treading on, Jesus, Yeshua said, even treading on scorpions and serpents, I give you authority. So what are scorpions and serpents represent? The demonic realm. We have the authority to step on the devil's head and to crush his plans. And in that, the Father promises, whatever territory he's possessed in your life, you can now take it back. 
Hallelujah. We find redemption through that so amazing process. So the right ear to listen, the right thumb to do the works of God, and the right toe so that we, every place on which our foot shall tread has now become holy. The blood on my toe makes the ground that I walk on holy. The blood on my hand makes everything I touch holy. And everything that I hear from the Father is now holy. Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? Now, I'm not a Cohen. I'm not a priest. I'm not a Levite. I'm probably not even Jewish by my heritage. But I am after the order of Melchizedek like Messiah. I'm a prophet and a priest in my home, just like you can be if you're the leader in your home. Father wants to restore what was lost and put his blood on those areas of our lives so it makes us holy again as well. So we're supposed to take the breast of the ram. <coughs> it's a wave offering before the Lord. Consecrate it. Uh, anything else the meat, uh, the meat is meant for Aaron and his sons. They're supposed to consume it. And they will belong uh, to it with a contribution from the people uh, of all Israel from the peace offering, their contribution to the Lord. Then we have the next session, which is the holy garment. Uh, the holy garments of Aaron will be used by his sons after him, and they will be anointed and consecrated in them. The son who became Cohen in his place, who comes into the tent of meeting to serve in the holy place, to wear them for seven days. Take the ram of consecration, boil its meat in the holy place. Aaron and his sons will eat the ram's meat and the bread in the basket at the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days. So seven, of course, is the number of completion. It's a number which God chose to create the world in. And the seventh day is the day of rest. It's the day of honoring the Lord in all that we say and do. <clears throat> Did God ever change uh, his day from Saturday to Sunday? Interesting question, right? If he did, why isn't it in the Bible? Saturday is consecrated to the Lord as a day of rest. Now, in the New Testament, under the, the principles of, of obeying the spirit of the law, then we have to pray about, Lord, what does the day of rest mean for me? How do I honor you in that area? We obey the Ten Commandments as New Testament believers. Which one of the Ten Commandments do you not obey? You obey all of them, right? And then why do we skip over the Third Commandment? Let's pay attention and take a day of rest. God knows we'll work ourselves to death. <laughs> he wants us to rest. Did he need to rest when he created the world? No, but he wants to set an example and a pattern for us as humans. Follow God's example. You're going to be much happier if you do. So each day the bull offering is, is offered, and then we go down to verse 38. Now this is what you're to offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old, regularly every day. <clears throat> and this goes into some of the details about those offerings in the morning at dusk. One lamb to offer two quarts of, of flour, mixes one quart of oil. So uh, as a drink offering, etc. lots of details about these types of offerings. Then I'll meet the people. So then it says, through all your generations, this is to be regular burnt offering at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So when I picture the temple, whether it's the Mishkan, or the Beis HaMichadesh. Mishkan is the mobile temple. Beis HaMichadesh means the house of the Holy One, the actual physical structure of Solomon's temple uh, and uh, or the second temple. Um, then I picture it smelling like a barbecue. And I don't know about you, but I love barbecues. <laughs> I love it when I come over to someone's house and the meat's on the grill. It says fellowship. It says this is a time of rest and fellowship with my friends. And I believe God wanted his temple to have that same image for us. Then we walk into his presence. When we draw near, we smell the sweet aroma of barbecue on the grill. And the Father says, come my people, come join me, come fellowship with me. Make yourselves holy that I might bless you. And I really, I like the Yiddish accent too, by the way. But, <laughs> but I think that's the Father's heart. That's why the sacrifices were done. To cover sins, to remove sins, and to remind us. His desire is to fellowship with us. That's what we had in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. And that's what the Father's been trying to get back to for the past 6,000 years, is to come back to walking with Him in the cool of the day and fellowshipping with the Most High. And that's a beautiful, beautiful image in my mind. So when I think of that, the smell of grain, and etc., I think that, uh, that that's the Father saying, come fellowship with me. Let us sup with one another. Uh, come and, and eat. Anyone who's thirsty, let him come. Anyone who's hungry, let him come. And I will fill you with all that you need and rivers of living water that will flow out of your innermost being. And that's such a beautiful thought to me. So <clears throat> as we conclude here, um, I just want to make a point.
to remind you that everything that he touches becomes holy. And we can ask for that in our daily lives. So let's do that right now. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this example in the Torah that we can come before you as the burnt offering, as the sacrifice for sin, and you desire to make us holy again, to cleanse us from our unrighteousness so that we can come before you boldly before the throne of grace. So forgive us our sins, wash us and cleanse us. Help us to forgive those who've sinned against us, to let go of those things and say, I hold them not accountable anymore because if I'm forgiven, then I can forgive others. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and amen. Well, thank you for joining me today, my friends. And we just pray that the Father continues to open the eyes of your understanding. That you'd see the gospel on every page of the Torah because it's there. Have a blessed day. Shalom Alechem. If you have a prayer request or have any questions, contact Digital Pastor Jim at 719-243-0996. That phone number again is 719-243-0996 or text him at that number or email us at the Wild Branch Ministries at gmail.com. Your tax deductible donations to these ministries are greatly appreciated.